evening to everybody. I would like to uh, welcome you this evening to Cafe Scientifique. My name is Alan Hermson, and I'm the director of the Montana Embry Program, which sponsors this event together with the uh, uh, Colbury at, here at MSU. And these both are grants from the National Institutes of Health. They are grants to increase research infrastructure in Montana and at MSU. And uh, so the CAFE is one of the programs uh, that we do here. And uh, I can tell you a little bit about the CAFE Scientific. if you haven't been here before. Uh, the CAFE, the format for the CAFE is about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or more, whatever our speaker uh, wishes. And uh, during that time, uh, she'll present uh, her, her, uh, her talk. And we'll take a break, maybe for about 10 minutes, and you can get more food or some drinks if you'd like. And then when we come back, uh, that'll be your chance to, to ask questions of our speaker uh, for the, the rest of the time for the, for the evening. And a few other things. Um, if you're not on our listserv, you can sign. There's a sign-up sheet out in the hallway there to get on our email to get notifications for the cafe uh, events. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Deborah McCauley. Uh, Deborah received her undergraduate degree at Wells College and her veterinary degree at the University of London Royal Veterinary College. And getting the degree there allowed you to practice internationally, is that right? And uh, of course, she is a wildlife veterinarian and she is the executive director of Wildlife Health at VIEW, which is a veterinary initiative or endangered wildlife, uh, which she fo uh, founded in response to the growing threat of disease transmitted by domestic animals, uh, or transmitted between domestic animals and humans, uh, and to endangered wildlife. She works with uh, Nepal's Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conservation and the National Trust for Nature Con Conservation uh, to help develop a disease surveillance wildlife health program. In addition, Dr. McCauley has worked with the Wildlife Conservation Society, Society's Wolverine Program, Montana's Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and Zoo, Zoo Montana. And so, and she will be telling us about wildlife health and the One Health in Nepal. So, welcome. Turkey on um, Thanksgiving, I was out capturing an Asian one-horned rhino in Nepal. And so I'm excited. I arrived back on Sunday night, late midnight, and thank you to my neighbor, Steve, who um, hosted my, my family over Thanksgiving because I wasn't expecting not being here. Um, so I am here to talk to you about wildlife health in Nepal. And um, most of you think of Nepal as Mount Everest and the Himalayas. What you might not realize is just below the Himalayas is a long stretch land of jungle, and those jungle have lots and lots of endangered and threatened species. So, to begin, I came to Nepal um, being asked by World Wildlife Fund to uh, help capture a, a Bengal tiger for research. And just to let you know that there are only 3,200 tigers left in the wild, of all the species. And there are actually more captive tigers than there are wild tigers. So this really is the draw, was the draw for me. It's always really the basis and the impetus for the work I do. Um, but really, um, once I got there, I realized that there was so much more work to be done. <laughs> so just to give you a map, I love maps. Um, this is the, well, from the historic and the present um, tiger habitat range in all in Asia. This is Nepal. It rests right near, here's the Triarc landscape, between India and um, China. And the Triarc landscape, these are the Himalayas, and the Triarc landscape is this green area. And all these little green spots are the national parks. And Nepal is amazing. Their Department of National Parks, they're really pushing and wanting to have conservation in their country. So um, they have a number due to the king. They designated a number of national parks throughout Nepal, and that's where I work. <clears throat> so this 
So in Nepal, we have it's home to 163 globally threatened species, not just Bengal tigers, but they have rhinos, they have wild elephants, they have red pandas, they have snow leopards, they have all of these amazing, incredible species right there. Wildlife conservation has historically really focused on two main things. And I ask any of you, you probably could tell me that tigers are going extinct because of habitat encroachment and poaching. But one aspect that really hasn't been, or is starting to be looked at more seriously is disease and that impact on uh, critically endangered species particularly. We've watched species like wild dog and black-footed ferrets die and go extinct due to things like canine distemper. These are diseases that tigers can get. So it's not just two things. It's three legs of the stool. And disease, you might not realize, species share diseases like we do, but they also share diseases between species, and they also share species, diseases with humans, rabies, I always see this picture, I think rabies. 70% um, of the diseases that we have, we share with animals. Did you know that? 70%. So when I got to the Triarch landscape, I started taking pictures. And I took pictures of agricultural humans. Now, Nepal, if you can think of Montana being two and a half times larger than Nepal, we have one million people that live in Montana. There are about 30 million people that live in this country. And in the 70s, prior to the 70s, they used to live in the higher regions, in the Himalayas because of malaria. Well, the wonderful chemical DDT eradicated malaria, and people started descending upon tiger and rhino habitat. And with them, they brought their domestic animals. They brought their cattle, they brought their dogs. And did you know that tigers are just big kitty cats? They can get the same diseases as cats, they can get the same diseases as large as dogs, they're large felids, they can get what's called canine distemper, which is really a carnivore disease. And we know this because for decades we've seen the same diseases in captive tigers all over the world and we vaccinate for it. We have um, preventive medicine for that. And so um, we know, and they can get tuberculosis, they can get actually bird flu, <laughs> they can get anthrax and rabies and all these diseases. But it's not just tigers. These are all endangered species really can get very, very, um, very sick from a lot of diseases that humans and domestic animals can, can give. So, um, not meaning to get this picture of me, it's actually looking at the tiger. I, um, when I was in the field, um, and I went to Nepal, three weeks in the, in the jungle, and I started hearing stories about tigers. I started hearing stories about tigers that were sick, um, a tiger that died in India, and the biologist there was saying, I know he didn't die of being run over by an elephant, even though the veterinarians were telling me that. There was no outward lesion, they just buried him. So really what was happening was that, really conspiracy, they just didn't really have the infrastructure to look any further than the outward lesions, those outward signs. Um, so then I started seeing it myself. 2012, I um, was on this capture. This is a tiger in the buffer zone of Chitwan National Park. He had just um, killed a, an old woman collecting firewood. It's very common for people to go into the buffer zone and collect firewood and, and grass for their domestic animals and for their, for their firewood. And, um, and I was on an elephant, that's how you capture rhinos, that's how you capture tigers. Um, I could see easily, as a veterinarian, it's very easy for me to see hind limb atrophy. Hind limb, hind limb atrophy. Um, he was also almost paralyzed. He could use his front end, but he couldn't use his hind end. But the story kept being habitat encroachment. This is a subadult. I'm like, no, it's not a subadult. This is a sub-adult leaving the park, looking for more habitat because he was getting pushed out by an adult tiger and, um, and therefore we need more habitat. And I was pounding down my fist why we started was because I was saying, no, this is a tiger who has a chronic disease and, um, and I believe that we really need to investigate disease. Well, a couple years later, we still have the same tiger, he still has a chronic disease. He didn't, he wasn't attacked by a larger tiger. He has a chronic disease. He still has 
um, high in atrophy. He still has, uh, he's still emaciated. And so, um, so we, these are the stories that I was hearing. These are the stories that helped me develop um, hearing what was going on. That's very important. Um, this is just last week. Um, a baby tiger came in. Little guy, so cute. No outward lesions, no, no signs of, um, of uh, advanced signs, no signs of, of being attacked by another animal. Um, but when I opened them up, and I'm sorry, I am going to show me Cropsy pictures. They're of animals, so I'm sure you guys hunt for not very scared of them. Um, these are lesions, of <clears throat> lung lesions, consolidated lung tissue. This is normal tissue. Consolidated lung tissue down here, both middle lobes were consolidated. Um, all lung, lung lobes were affected. I found focal lesions in the brain. I found um, melanoma, which is bloody diarrhea in the colon, and abnormal kidneys. <clears throat> so pointing again to infectious disease. Um, one other rogue veterinarian, um, Dr. Susan Makota, excellent veterinarian, works with captive elephants. She diagnosed um, tuberculosis in 24% of the 200 elephants that worked in Chitwan National Park. Um, that's a high number. Where did she get it? She was able to find out that actually it's mycobacterium um, tuberculosis. It originated from humans. In, unlike in Africa, where M. bovis is pretty predominant in the elephants due to the um, animals that live outside and around the park who really have a high number of tuberculosis. In Asia, humans and elephants live very closely together. They actually live under one roof. They live right next to each other. So it's um, transmitted through aerosol, and it's transmitted from elephant to he from human to elephant, or from elephant to elephant. Now my question is, how badly is this in the wild elephant population? And we know that tuberculosis can go through all species. So it's not just elephants. And if it's not only elephants, it's not humans not only um, giving it to potential wildlife, their domestic animals potentially are too, since they have, it's, as I showed you, agricultural animals are abutting. It's not like our, our um, buffer zone in Yellowstone, which is what, six million acres. It's literally, I mean, you've got a national park and then you have people. If anybody's been to Nepal, you know. These are the lungs. Um, I've seen this many times. This is just uh, another necropsy of a, of a elephant who has tuberculosis and it's just basically puffed. <clears throat> so there were problems. I was seeing problems, I was hearing problems. This is um, last year, this, this guy came in. You'll never see this. This is a river dolphin. A river dolphin, known to be, thought to be extinct, thought to be really minimal in Nepal, um, I guess in 2000, maybe guest eight. This came in, and, um, and we know, we can see that it probably died of a propeller. But, but what we really also want to know, I mean, this is one of the last species on Earth. We really want to be able to do a necropsy. Well, maybe he died of a propeller, but maybe he was sick, and he went up, you know, and, and, and got, it was not as quick as he may have been, and, and he had another underlying disease problem, which is a constant theme I'm trying to explain when I'm in Nepal. Um, so no critical information is lost, or um, sample collection is, is, um, is really just a preservation of the species rather than really looking at um, taking biological samples. Um, there's really has been no standard protocol and no database, and it's not because they don't want to. I mean, let me tell you, these people are incredibly passionate. These people are, it's so exciting to, to work with them. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit in the future, but you know, once I, I was on the ground and they kept telling me these problems, and, um, and I kept thinking, I can't not help with this problem. I can't not help this because there, these, I have a, a colleague who works in labs um, in all over Africa in wildlife, and she says, you know, I work there, I try to train, but nobody's really that interested. I said, in Nepal, they're up before I am, and I get up really early, and they're still at the, at the um, research station by the time I leave. These people are extremely passionate. So some of the other problems I was seeing, just briefly, quickly, to say, um, these are Three baby rhinos the first year I was there, only one is living now. Two of them are not. Uh, really, I've discussed and starting to put protocols together for um, nutrition and also for preventive medicine. Um, 
And this is a tiger being translocated. And at this, this time, um, biological samples were not taken. I really want to make sure that biological samples are taken. Because remember that tiger I said, who um, you find, find one in a hotel lobby that's, um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't speak, tell you the story. There was a, a tiger that was in a hotel lobby, walking in aimlessly in the middle of the day. And, um, and they just thought habitat encroachment. If you ask anybody in the US, is if a raccoon walks into a hotel lobby in the middle of the day, are you gonna think of habitat encroachment or are you gonna start thinking of rabies or canine distemper? Tigers get canine distemper and rabies. Well, that tiger that walked into the hotel lobby in the middle of the day was translocated to a nearby um, park. Now, it could have been a diseased tiger or a diseased animal uh, going to a, a naive population. So, you know, we need to understand, and we're, and we're getting better at this. We didn't know, you know, this information 10, 20 years ago. We now know that we, we can get better at understanding disease and understanding the implications of if we translocate an animal, we want to be careful on, um, on what diseases that we transmit with them. So, uh, so these are the things I wanted to repeat. There was no infrastructure. You need electricity to have a freezer now, don't you? If you don't have electricity in the field, and you have a, an animal that you need to take an ecropsy on, you need to be able to put it, put those samples properly stored, right? Um, there was no lab. This was the laboratory. <laughs> this was the, the medical lab. Um, there were no wildlife health. Um, there was really not training. There was a lot of training in wildlife. I mean, Nepal is amazing on on their their conservation. I'm just extremely impressed. Um, but there was really minimal work being done. And yet, Dr. Gairi, the sole wildlife veterinarian for all of Nepal, he works in the, he's the chief veterinarian for um, the Department of National Parks. He has 63 globally threatened species that he's got to care for, and he's out there, I mean, really over, overworked. Um, but there are so many veterinarians and so many wildlife professionals that are really interested and, and um, embrace this. So that's not, not hard. So I formed you after listening, after seeing problems, and, um, and my partner is um, the former director of, um, she was the former director of conservation medicine at the veterinary school in, in Tufts University. She's now our president. Um, she and um, we have created a mission for her view, which is investigate, diagnose, and manage health issues. Now, it's really, about disease surveillance and, and trying to trying to look at these problems, see these issues, and um, and and try to put put in in place some of the problems that we've had, the problems that we've seen. So putting together consistent protocols, um, making sure that we collect biological samples. We don't have endangered species that that we don't get those samples from. Um, we must take postmortem examinations, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And um, and try to get research being done, try to get diagnostics on, on those samples, try to get them. I mean, we're now working with the government in order to get CITES in order to submit samples to the di proper diagnostic lab. It's not as easy when I worked at Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, we just send it across the street and, um, and the diagnostic lab would be able to investigate for us. So, solutions to the problem. So in a, in a developing country, you have a lot of challenges. Um, and and um, if you are, are faced with challenges that um, they're not interested, then, then it's really not a point. But I have um, started training workshops, and I just got back of three weeks of doing some training workshops. And, and I'm going to share with you some of the pictures um, that I have had from the last couple of weeks um, by implementing training workshops, um, capture and mobilization. Uh, I, I do training workshops on capture and mobilization because that is an ample opportunity to collect biological samples. Um, I train in postmortem examination, and um, one of the things that's really important is, as I said, if we share 70% of the diseases with animals, we really have to think about um, diseases that, that the human, humans can get, and human safety is a really critical factor. Um, it's, you have a lot, safety is, is really at the lower point in, in um, in some of these countries, and, and trying to be able to discuss um, not transmitting disease and, and people, keeping people safe during capture is really critical. Um, I've helped on wildlife capture. 
and um, providing veterinary support and infrastructure, and I'll, I'll go through that. So wildlife capture um, is workshops where I, I teach lectures, um, I train technicians, um, show them how to use dart guns. We do um, mobilizations at the zoo, and that's my opportunity to really talk about wildlife health. It's one of the first introductions um, to wildlife health that I have with the people on the ground that really need to learn it. So the game scouts are the ones, those are the front line who actually are doing the captures. They're the ones that are seeing the dead animals, the fresh dead animals, that, that cub um, that we'll see in a few minutes, that um, it's really, they, they, bring, they can bring them to us right away, or if um, you have one veterinarian and all of Nepal is in Chitwan, and 20 hours away, something, an endangered species like a tiger dies in Suklahanta National Park, we're training these folks to be able to really be able to collect samples to understand um, disease implications. So here's just an example of um, sample collection. <clears throat> when we do necropsy workshops, um, that's um, not only teaching, but I often find, and, and just talking about you know working in a developing country, I find a lot of groups will come in and they'll lecture which is wonderful and really important. But I have often found they'll come in and they'll lecture and nobody in the room actually understands English. And so I always bring with me um, a translator from the vet school. But I also, after the lectures, will do a practical to really have hands-on experience to show them, you know, just as the immobilizations, we show them, because then I also find there's a lot of things that we're missing, though I, I know what my lectures are about, they might not um, actually be able to implement what we've taught them. So we implement what they taught them. But another critical factor, a really critical factor, is to provide them with the tools that they need. Now these folks literally do not have, they, they don't have enough money to, to buy a scalpel and a, and a blade. Um, they, they wouldn't, you know, most of them have been, if they lived in Chitwan National Park, they have never gone to any other park. They've never left that location because the cost of them is great. <clears throat> so, so providing, um, you know, not only lectures but but um, the practicals and the infrastructure to help. So, I'm just going to show you some pictures from our capture on Thanksgiving. Um, these are a little baby rhino and a couple of um, in Guardian National Park. Um, this was just prior to our, our rhino capture. There's a collaring. And um, this is Dr. Guidi. These are the wildlife technicians. This wildlife technician right here, um, Vishnu, he's probably, I can pretty much say that he has captured more tigers and rhinos than any single person in the world. Um, he is an amazing, amazing wildlife technician. But he's retiring. And Dr. Guidi is retiring. They're both retiring in three years. So it is really me who has been helping both of them to show um, to do these lectures to help, as we were saying, not only do the lectures, but also to help to provide infrastructure to, to get the, the, the game scouts and the younger veterinarians to help train them for the future. His, the, and the team is excellent. I mean, you cannot get a better, <laughs> get a better technician. It's amazing. So you go out, how, how do you, does anybody know how one captures a, a rhino in, um, <laughs> in Nepal? <laughs> You don't get on an ATV or a snowmobile or a truck or a helicopter like I've done in Montana. Um, you actually get on elephants. <laughs> it's fun. So we're going out to a, um, actually this is right at the community forest between Bardi National Park and in India. So they're looking at um, rhinos um, um, migration, or they don't really migrate, but the, the their movement um, in this community forest than if they do get out to India or not. But great, great opportunity to um, do sample collection and to train in sample collection. Um, they've heard me a million times talking about importance of disease, but it also is a time, it's something that, you know, even now is just starting to be looked at in the U.S. is when you immobilize a, a wildlife, it's one thing to immobilize a deer and you've got lots of it, but it's not okay to not monitor anesthesia when you're talking about a critically endangered species. So um, it provides also in that moment, it provides the opportunity to, to talk about and to train in uh, monitoring, looking at respiration, looking at heart rate. 
It can tell you a lot of things about how light they are, how deep, deep they are, looking at their color. <clears throat> so this is just pictures, because I just came back to show you. Uh, we colored them, he got up, and he ran away. <laughs> they darted him right there. Um, and not to show you silly pictures of me, and I'm sorry, but it does at least show you right? these silly pictures that um, I always bring a box with me to collect the samples. And you can even bring, I brought huge oxygen tanks on elephants. Um, so Dr. Guyre kept on saying, well, I can't, you know, collect samples, I'm the only vet, and he has to really think when he's doing a tiger, and a lot of it is for management purposes. So you've got a tiger in a, in a village. You don't have no, just the tiger and your capture team. You might have hundreds, if not thousands, of people surrounding you when you're trying to capture that tiger and move it out of the way into a safe area. So Dr. Gowdy really doesn't have the opportunities that we may have here, luxury of being able to collect samples. So um, we've hired a veterinarian, Dr. Sudraj Savidi. Um, he has, was a recent graduate from the vet school. Um, and here we were actually treating this tiger, you'll see in a little bit. Um, we helped so that he has supplies for Dr. Guyvey, which does not have the, you know, pot enough. When I met Dr. Guyvey, he went out, we were capturing a tiger, and he had just a little um, cardboard box to go out. You know, and I'm with my kit, I've got my backpack, I've got my surgical kit, I've got all my, you know, oxygen. And, um, so it's amazing uh, what, what they can do on such, on such little, means it's amazing. So this is um this is Dr. Gaidi. Um, so he we're right on the edge of Chitwan National Park um, and he is the, the chief wildlife veterinarian for Nepal. Um, and also right behind this is um is Dr. Gaidi's um, house really as I guess and have much else. But um, National Parks for Nature Conservation is a nonprofit organization based in Nepal started by the King years ago, twenty years ago. And it's a wonderful, wonderful research station right there on the border of Chitwan National Park, pretty much embedded in the National Park. And you've got the arm, army right here. Um, and they have elephants. Um, and he, upstairs are the classrooms, downstairs the office. This is um, the veterinary office. And we have the veterinary lab behind that. This is our veterinary lab. This is a wildlife um, technician who, is, um, who was a veterinary intern for Dr. Gagne. And, um, and the most important is really providing electricity. They didn't have electricity when I first came. Um, but if you, have, if you have freezers, you need to have backup generator, you need to have batteries um, to back up that generator just in case that goes out. Um, and you need to have the proper instruments in order to collect. And we do, um, <clears throat> and research needs to be done. And so, if, you know, in Nepal, wildlife health, even though, um, there is so much that needs to get done, and there are so many students that are so interested in wildlife health, and so many students that are interested in one health, which is the, the marrying between zoonotic disease and um, uh, human disease and, and wildlife or human health. And um, so we try to encourage veterinary, um, female veterinarians to come out with us, but this, um, we were just testing dogs in the buffer zone. Um, let's show you Chichwan National Park, which is a really good, um, so here is Chich the Chichwan National Park, this is where the research station is. There are four uh, veterinary <coughs> clinics around in the buffer zone. This gray area is the buffer zone. And we went around to each clinic. Um, we told the community that we were going to have a, um, a vaccination campaign and sampling of the dogs for in December. And I mean, within a day, we had 100 dogs. It was really easy to get compliance from the local community because they know that they're, that they're, they're Neighboring dogs carry things like rabies, and they probably see neighbors and, and kids' neighbors um, die of diseases that they can get from domestic animals. So um, we did that, and I thought, it, you know, I wasn't too sure if it was going to be difficult or not, but we found that it was really easy, really easy to implement. So this will be a really good base to look at other diseases um, at that, at that human-domestic animal interface with wildlife, like tuberculosis like um, to birth, uh, rabies. So that's, this is, will be the, initial, the main template for the future research. Um, just to say, I, I worked with the children in Thailand um, about wildlife health as well. 
So um, just to finish up, I wanted to say that we do, um, wildlife health is something that we must look at as a holistically. We want to look at all the species. We want to look at all the critically endangered species with the most important diseases. And we want to be able to approach it by trying to address this as um, investigating disease. We want to try to do preventive medicine. Um, and what will be nice is if we do get some idea of what diseases are in those buffer zones, we can do what they're doing in, in Africa. They're watching tiger, watching lions die of canine distemper and tuberculosis, and they're doing ring vaccinations and um, ring pre preventive medicine around the parks. Um, but it is also really nice to be able to be involved in having success stories on endangered wildlife as well. So just to finish up, I have, um, this is a baby Asian one-horned rhino that came in this past spring, was attacked by a tiger. Um, his his um, knee was completely mangled, and if anybody knows anything about a cat bite and how that can go systemic really quickly, just imagine a tiger bite and crunching bones. Well, <clears throat> when I got there, he was, um, it, I, it was pretty sick. He wasn't eating very well. He was recumbent a lot of times, which means he was lying down a lot. He was really nervous. Um, he wasn't using that limb. He was definitely non-weight bearing. They were teaching him right here how to um, drink from a bottle to a, a bucket. But if you notice, they don't even have bottles there, so it was just this makeshift cloth thing. Um, he um, had a lot of lesions. Um, this, I know it's a gross picture, but this was his leg when it first came out there, and big chunks of fractured bone were, were um, being um, sequestered out of that wound. But it's an amazing opportunity. I came in and helped um, with wound care management, not only of the, the rhino, but I also use, always, every time I go, use the opportunity to train, every single time. So, um, <clears throat> lots of training on, um, on wound care management. He's actually using that, that joint. I absolutely didn't think he was gonna use that joint. If you can imagine being a couple hundred pounds, not being able to use a joint, that's one thing, but being a couple tons and not using a joint is a really bad thing. So I, I think I did burst into tears. Um, so I, I definitely felt that um, we did, did a good job here. Another was um, last winter, I came in and there was this tiger, completely emaciated, you can see all of his um, vertebrae, um, very thin, and, um, and we treated him, the new veterinarian and, and the Department of National Parks, um, used that opportunity for training as well. And um, this is just him being not enjoying the treatments. And, um, <clears throat> and so each opportunity is, uh, is an opportunity for training. Each opportunity is an opportunity to empower the local community. Um, to empower the, the local community to take, take on wildlife health on their own. And it's a terrible picture, it's my iPhone. But he looked really bad there, but he's very healthy. And guess what? He was re-released into the wild um, this past summer. So, okay. Thank you. aspect. And um, the question is, how supportive is the government in, in the work that I do? I, I didn't get into too much detail, and I'm really glad you asked that question. Um, I wouldn't have started VIEW, I wouldn't have uh, founded this organization without actually the government wildlife veterinarian telling me what all of the needs were. I wouldn't have started VIEW without actually working with the government and the local NGOs, um, understanding all of the issues that were needed and being complete, really embraced by um, the government. In fact, the, um, the rhino capture that we were just on 
it was a largely um, government organization, the NGO uh, World Wildlife Fund and NTNC. Um, and so it, they, um, they're really understanding the issues. I am amazed at how much they've embraced it. And although we're working with them on being able to submit diagnostic samples abroad for, um, for evaluation, um, we are having a lot of support um, from the government, and not necessarily financially, and I think that that will come, and I have been told that eventually that will come, but because they just simply can't. But they have on many levels. I mean, I, I can't capture a tiger on my own without the government supporting me. I, I can't go out on rhino capture without them understanding who I am and, and, um, and understanding the work that I do. And it all is really about supporting that one um, primary government veterinarian. Yes? Um, really good, good question because right now um, endangered wildlife really live in these tiny little pockets, and um, there are, I mean, you can see bald eagles who started really were endangered from nothing and are really flourishing now. I don't know if that answer can be can be met um, without really. I, I, I don't know if I can necessarily answer that, but I think that they they will become healthy in that. Places like Chitwan and Bardia, which do have, Chitwan has approximately 150 tigers, and Bardia has 50 tigers. Um, Suplafanta has about a dozen. And um, some of the organizations are really trying to increase those borders uh, so that there can be communication um, as, on a larger scale for genetics. But I think the focus has been in the past about looking at the genetics and now realizing that once you open those, um, those borders, one, you may be opening those borders, and if you don't look at disease, you're going to have empty corridors. And two, um, if, you're, if you don't understand the disease dynamics between domestic animals, humans, and wildlife, then um, you're going to open those corners and maybe create more problems. Yes, sir. The area, the area where you're working at, do you talk in the community like the terrible effects of climate change in regards to wildlife? And what? Wildlife disease proliferation. Really good question, and I think that is a, a very valid. Um, the question was about um, climate change in relationship to disease. What we see um, in Nepal, and I think all over the world, we're watching glaciers um, melt. We're watching um, agricultural crops burn. We're watching um, the changes in patterns of human human behavior because of climate change. And that absolutely is going to have an impact on, on disease as well, because it may change. Um, in, it may change the population moving to certain areas, and it will change um, where the where that disease interface is. So yes, I think climate change, and particularly places like Nepal, um, are going to be very sensitive to that. Yes, that's it. Oh, listen, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, the question was, um, where do the veterinarians on the ground in Nepal get their training? Our research station is really amazingly strategically located. You had a picture of Chichwa National Park. Um, our research station is stationed right next to the veterinarian um, for all of Nepal. But it's only about 20 kilometers away from the vet school of Nepal. Um, it's now called the um, Agricultural Forestry University. And our vet students, it's really easy for me to do a workshop with the Game Scouts and just hire a car, pick up a dozen vet students, and they're all excited to come. And I don't care if they're interested in wildlife or not, they, they're, they're sponges, they want to learn. Um, so it's really easy for me to get all the vet students to participate in all the workshops and the programs and the training that I do. So they're all uh, Nepali based. I saw this old man, except for one woman, which is probably you, I couldn't tell. But is it basically men who are being saved? Um, 
Yes, it's um, a majority, sort of like here in Montana, majority of the wildlife uh, professionals are, um, are men. Um, I just taught a Game Scout, um, Game Scouts in Chitwan National Park last week. They have junior Game Scouts that came in, and there is one female in that. And um, I always encourage when I get the vet students from the vet school that they have to have a couple of girls, women, sorry, um, from the vet students to come in, come on the bus, so they're not allowed to, to come. So we encourage women. <laughs> yes. Uh, I really appreciate your presentation. So much. And also appreciate the way that you were um, talking about one's health and the connection between the animals and people. I'm wondering what you could say about more challenges in the fall. So, um, yeah, this the question is about One Health and um, and about human health in Nepal. I have um, sat down with directors of hospitals, um, really interested in human health in, in Nepal and how we can share this um, this project. And um, it's a lot of it is just fire brigade and not preventive medicine. Um, and from at least. Um, some of the people in the health department that I've spoken with. And um, for example, um, I really wanted to know about um, a disease called leptospirosis that causes acute renal failure in, in um, animals. And I kept hearing about um, a lot of people dying of renal disease. And so I'm very interested in that interface um, on the buffer zone about looking at things like leptospirosis. But when I tried to inquire um, on local um, health organizations in that area, they are do they're just trying to treat. And the same thing that right now, we're collecting samples, but it's very hard to get the diagnostics because they don't have the ability to do virus isolation and do virus viral research in Nepal yet. Um, we have to rely on other um, diagnostic labs internationally. And so the same is they don't have one for human, much less for domestic or for for your wildlife to investigate things that are viral related. Um, so really the diagnostic part is very difficult. So it's really just trying to treat the problems. So the same, all the domestic animal, human and, and wildlife. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Jim? Yeah, Jim. Yeah, I think So, pardon? Well, it's not actually, um, I feel like I'm getting my arms around it because we have um, so many people that are interested. And the question is um, about the pioneering initial stages of, of um, wildlife disease. Um, we do have a lot of, our, we have, are collecting and, and let's just say storing samples of of endangered wildlife to look at disease in the future. Because once we can understand disease, once we can get those samples back, which I'll get next week, um, on a, a domestic dog, canine distemper, in the buffer zone in Chichuan, and the samples of the tigers that I've seen that have died with potential other infectious diseases, let's say canine distemper, um, then I, my colleague, who was the former director of conservation medicine at Tufts Veterinary School, we worked with the Humane Society, who is now the president of Humane Society International, Andrew Rowan. It's people like him, and there's, it actually becomes a small world. It's people like him that once we get our diagnostics, we can leverage. It's always about it. So what I'm always doing is trying to leverage um, the ability to use other organizations. Hey, Humane Society, you're doing vaccinations and, and, um, and spay and neuter all over Nepal. Let's focus on tiger ha habitat, and this is why. So really, it is once we get the scientific science down, um, it will be about leveraging as much as we can with other organizations to partner with. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, several years ago, in some international uh, this book was addressed. There was a story about something like four hundred thirty virus just disappeared, and those disappeared during those years. Why I started you? So the question was: um, There were 20 rhinos that died in Nepal. This is 
is true. I believe in Bardia National Park. Um, and unless I see the scientific evidence, I'm not going to just assume. And a lot of assumption has to happen. A lot of assumption has happened. Because they haven't had, and it's not just Nepal, it's all over the world, we haven't had um, the technology that we do today on uh, looking at disease. And so when an animal disappears or an animal um, dies and we don't have an explanation for it, we try to find explanations and we try to give answers. And then once we give an answer, it's believed. And so I really, you know, I heard that story too. And, uh, but you can have sudden death of 20 rhinos like that due to anthrax. Um, and so really, I don't, you know, um, many stories I've heard of, there was a die-off of gar um, last year, and that's an endangered species. There's, um, and, and, and this happens all over the world. This is not unique to Nepal at all. But that really, um, we, when we have animals that die, we really need to, to look um, closer. Because unless we understand uh, what the real causes are, then we're not going to be able to help uh, mitigate and treat it. So Nepal is a small country, so it's probably a good place for you to be living this year. And I think of India right next door. Are they having some of the same challenges? So the question is, um, um, Nepal is a small country. One of the reasons why I like working in there, um, that India is much larger, and they want to know if they have the same same problems there. When I started um, collecting samples and having, we started first time I ever collect samples in, in um, biological samples in Nepal because we had a freezer, it was 2010. Um, at that time, I was really trying to work with the government, saying, hey, I'm seeing problems with the tigers. We really need to get this, these samples shipped abroad to look, um, to get a proper diagnostics on it. And during that time, last year, there were four tigers in India that died of canine distemper, and 86 tigers zero positive for canine distemper. So yes, we absolutely are. That was the first time. Now, I want to um, make a note here, very important, and I wouldn't be on this path if it wasn't for Dr. Kathy Quigley, who diagnosed the first tiger with canine distemper in Russia. And it was her um, and her pioneering work in, in Russia that has helped me develop my program in, in, um, in Nepal. So, yes, there are other, uh, definitely diseases happening in, in India as well. Will you be expanding your program in China? <clears throat> the question is will I be expanding my program? Absolutely hope to, yes. Um, obviously, it depends on funding. Um, I don't want it to be about Dr. McCauley <coughs> working in Nepal. Not at all. My real, my real focus and my hope has always been about working throughout the whole um, landscape of tiger conservation. To uh, because it's not just about tigers. It's about it's about um, all endangered species. When you pick that piece from the species, you set the template. You can do a necropsy on a tiger, which is the same as doing a necropsy on a rhino, which is the same as doing a necropsy on a a dog. <laughs> right. um, and so you set the template for all the endangered species. Um, and I, what I'm trying to do really in Nepal is, is to set that template, to put standardized protocols throughout the region so that, yes, in Bhutan, I have already spoken to government officials in Bhutan. They're very interested. I'll be going to Myanmar um, next fall. And so, yes, um, once I set the template in Nepal, yes, I would like to move to other countries. Yes. The question is, um, where where do we send and investigate disease um, in in Nepal? So a complicated question actually, because Nepal does not have the diagnostics. But when we work with critically endangered species, it's easy to send, not wasn't so easy, but um, can, in theory, be very easy to send samples of a domestic dog to Washington to be diagnosed, or human um, disease to be submitted to a diagnostic lab abroad. But when you talk about critically endangered species, you must get a CITES. And in order to get a CITES, you cannot, it's not just Dr. Gairi who can write me a letter, which he has. And it's not just talking to the head of Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conservation, which I have, who are supportive. It's also about going higher into the ministry. And so these nuances they don't understand, really, diagnosing disease, it sounds easy. Let's diagnose the disease. Um, they want a diagnostic lab to be built in Nepal. 
And no matter how I explain that, well, if we don't even have the ability for virus isolation um, in humans, and we don't have the ability to investigate disease in domestic animals, we're probably not going to build a whole lab just for tigers. So um, right now, we are storing samples until the day that we can do diagnostics. But I am also working with an excellent diagnostic lab that has a level, which they didn't have two years ago. They now have a level of doing PCR. And so we will be able to at least look on uh, not the, the definitive diagnosis that I want, but we will be able to get some answers soon. Is that in India or where is that? In Nepal. I can't even send samples to India um, because you need scientists, no matter what. Yeah. Going on to the tiger conservation, um, conservation, um, what percentage of newborn cubs are still lost to insecticides? The question is um, with tigers and infanticide. I, um, and what percentage of tigers die due to infanticide? I do not know. Um, I don't know if anybody knows that answer. I'm sure nobody does. Um, however, I do know that most um, deaths of, of young animals, if you look across species, is disease, not necessarily due to conflict. Um, and the tiger cub, I don't know if you heard of that, the tiger cub that I did just did an necropsy on, um, there was actually the other, the one that was in the formal that I caught also had no external lesions due to um, advanced that. But I'm sure that. Um, but there, that there is, um, they, they do die due to conflict. Yes? Uh, thinking about your three legged school of unemployment, you talked much about disease. What about relatively habitat and poaching over the next fall or hold? Where is the greatest force uh, that you worry about? The, the greatest what? Okay, really good question. The question was. Of the three legs of the stool in Nepal, which is most important, um, habitat encroachment, poaching, or disease? So poaching, they have done a really amazing job at mitigating poaching. They have um, the army basically right there in the, um, in the parks. I just met a gentleman who is, um, has founded and has an, thousands of followers in um, a youth anti-poaching program around Ch uh, Bardia National Park. He has um, thousands and thousands of youth that actually go out and try and um, have this network, an amazing network, using social media, using telephones, using verbal mail to stop and mitigate for, for poaching. So they, and I wouldn't say they don't have zero. I know that they have some, but they have reduced an enormous amount of poaching. So that leaves you disease and habitat encroachment. If you have 30 million people and living around um, no buffer zone or a very minor buffer zone around these parks, um, you are going to have habitat encroachment and it's gonna be serious. But if you have humans and domestic animals that live right around those parks, there is, um, a, and we know that they die of disease, people die of disease, animals die of disease, um, that there is, a possi there is the possibility and I mean, I don't, I can't definitively say how many animals are dying of disease yet. Hope you ask me that in ten years' time. But, um, but I believe, and that's why I started you, is that this is a huge part, the problem that I'm seeing clinical signs of that um, that hasn't been addressed. So those two are, I would say, the most important. And when you get to critically endangered species, you have one outbreak, and you're done. Yes, sir. If we were to have a vaccination program, what would it look like? How would you go about doing vaccination and making sure you got all of them vaccinated? Great. Good question. Um, the question is about uh, preventive medicine. So once we get this diagnosis and we see that we have a problem, let's say, can I just stand for a rabies, um, how, what, what would a vaccination program look like? It's amazing how many tigers are um, we, that are immobilized due to conflict, um, human animal conflict. So they go out and they immobilize the tiger. Every single tiger that is gets a hands on is critical that they get a vaccination. We have been vaccinating tigers in captivity for a decade um, in, in, in zoos all over the world. We can do this. 
we are only down to 3,200. It's not about not, not vaccinating tigers. And then we should be doing what they do in Africa, which they have found that lions are, um, get canine distemper, um, populations do go extinct, small populations go extinct, they um, ebb and flow. Um, and so they're doing uh, ring vaccination of dogs in the buffer zones of the Serengeti and, and um, parks around um, Africa in order to reduce the amount of disease that it goes into the park. That has, from their studies, and I, I, I'm extrapolating, um, it has helped to reduce um, disease interface. However, we cannot forget that it's not canine distemper, it is carnivore distemper. So it does go into the wild populations. Yes? The what? The leg. Um, oh, sort of like, sort of like, she or he? Ah, uh, he. He. So he could walk. Is he, I mean, is his mother just right out there, or what happens to him? Great question. <laughs> Working on that one. Um, so you saw a lot of baby rhinos. Um, the question was, what happens to the baby rhinos once we've rehabilitated them? So Nepal has this amazing, has had a historically amazing ability to translocate rhinos. And they have immobilized, I think it's up to 80 rhinos. That's amazing. And they've been very successful at it. So I have talked to, and it's, it's, um, uh, it's an evolution, not a revolution. It's slowly discussing um, some of these issues with them. If we know how to immobilize and translocate the adult rhinos, when a baby rhino is attacked by a tiger, and that baby rhino, and that was only a three or four month old baby, when that baby um, rhino is rehabilitated, right now it's always going to be orphaned because they don't have, they don't have an enclosure. They don't have an enclosure to put the adult rhino in with the baby rhino. But there is a way to do it. If you have a, a baby rhino that's been attacked and you see the mother, we, there is the possibility to immobilize that adult rhino, bring it back to a rehabilitation facility that has a little sweeper where the baby can go in and out of a separate area, treat the baby rhino, but allow that baby rhino to still nurse and be with the mother, and then relocate it back out to, uh, back, back out to the wild, because if you, re, if you rehabilitate these babies now, it's forever going to be in, in jail for the rest of his life. So they're, they're, I'm working on that. I was just, um, in, in Canada, there's a woman named Beth, Beth Michelle Richardson. Um, she takes uh, orphan elephants, and she has one absolutely amazingly kind mother elephant that she can take her orphans to, <laughs> and this elephant adopts them. And, I mean, it's been a really good experience. It's a great idea. We have one female, and the, from the first picture you saw of the three babies, there was one female, um, and now there are two males. So that, although she's right now in um, at Central Zoo and in, in Kathmandu, um, there are almost annually um, orphan babies. Yes, sir. How, how are scientists regarding the you guys have great questions. I'm so glad <laughs> I have the opportunity to answer this. The question was, how are scientists regarded in Nepal? Well, me being a veterinarian, I am just a lowly veterinarian. Because in Nepal, you must have a master's after your veterinary degree and a PhD in order to work there. Science is paramount, and degrees are the word. So it's, it's in Asia, and um, in Nepal, as in throughout Asia, your education and your degrees are extremely important and you're very well regarded. So yes, they're very excited about wildlife conservation and everybody has a PhD, everybody's a doctor. They're, it's amazing and they're extremely super brains. So it's very, very exciting environment to work in. Are there eco-themed parks or something like this? I'm, I'm wondering about a sustainable business model for these folks. Like in Africa, a lot of a lot of folks who got together in East Africa, they were hunting uh, uh, villages together, and so the villages protect the animals to get different revenue into the 
hunger, and then the, and the villagers can share in that revenue. And then there's, there's a shared interest in keeping the livestock and, and, uh, and wildlife together, you know, and separate and, and that kind of thing. Is there anything like that in Nepal that would keep this thing going on the ground? The question is about um, ecotourism and the ability to maintain, um, maintain projects on long term. Um, there is a lot of interest in, in Nepal side to be able to develop um, uh, ecotourism and to keep things sustainable. Um, right now, for MTNC, the research station I work from, they have um, we have dormitories and we have um, classrooms, and we're constantly getting um, universities from all over the world coming in and training um, and sharing their knowledge in on the ground. There are projects um, coming up in the future that does marry um, a uh, hotel with with research, but um, at present they. I, I know that they're really interested in inviting that to Nepal, and there's been a lot of talk about it, but I don't think it's really active. Uh, any other questions? Well, I'm surprised that the government uh, is not uh, interested in, in preserving the national parks and their wildlife if there's not an economic benefit to them. A lot they, of, like ecotourism. They are very, the government is very interested in, in and they're really interested in, in uh, making sure and developing their national parks. And they do encourage, um, they really do encourage tourism. And one of the reasons that they want to keep their parks going is because of tourism. But necessarily to say that there is a hotel that, yeah, or, that they don't necessarily, that they have a much better um, programs, I would say, in Africa. But then again, there could be programs that I, I, am, I don't know about. Now I'll take the last question. You mentioned that you can only send samples across countries. Included a CITES? Do you mean like a CITES fluid? Or? Oh, so thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so used. A CITES is, um, is a permit, a very important permit that um, is for endangered species. So you must, um, sorry, CITES is um, a certificate for endangered wildlife in order to submit any body part or any, so you're not allowed to kill, you know, a rhino in Africa and bring it home um, unless, you know, so a CITES is you have to have a very specific permit or bring a wild animal in, uh, across borders. So a CITES, even if it is for research purposes and you're just bringing a lung sample to, you know, uh, to a diagnostic lab in another country, you have to have um, a specific permit through the government in Nepal and our government, and they both have, you know, a laundry list of things that are really important. So that's all. <coughs>